Dr. Ohenya Gold, and this is Science on the Street. And today I'm talking with Dr. Tom Holtz about T Rexes. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. It's good to be back. <laughs> it's good to be back in your office. That's right. Who I haven't been in for 15 years. Right. With Tyrannosaurus. Yeah. So, T Rexes, everyone's favorite. Why are they your favorite? Well, when I was quite small, about three years old, I got a toy very much like this one. It's the same model. It was white. I have long since lost the original. And um, I you know, asked what it was, and my mom said it was a dinosaur. Uh, I also got uh, a sauropod, a brontosaur toy as well, and I asked what it was. And uh, my mom said it was a dinosaur. And apparently I looked at her really skeptically, because how could they both be dinosaurs? Because they're so different from each other. And my mom didn't know how they could both be dinosaurs, but she was from an education background. And so she, um, she got a book, it was specifically the How and Why Wonder Book of Dinosaurs. And she started to read to me from it. And so I found out that there was this dinosaur, Tyrannosaurus Rex, and that it was the king of dinosaurs. And so I decided at that, 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 at that moment, I was gonna grow up to be a Tyrannosaurus Rex. Because first of all, if you wanna grow up to be a dinosaur, cool. And if you're gonna be a dinosaur, you might as well be the king dinosaur. So um, when I found out that I couldn't grow up to, uh, to be a T-Rex, I was still, you know, just fascinated with it. This giant creature, you know, big as a killer whale, but it's walking on land and this fearsome animal. Um, and so, you know, I was really into Tyrannosaurus, but then as I got older and started to read more about them um, and find out more about them, you know, to think, wow, these are actually fascinating creatures in and of themselves. You know, they're not simply not simply because they're so huge, but they have lots of, lots of specialized features and lots of interesting adaptations, and, uh, um, as well as being giant and huge and impressive. Um, and so sort of the more I got into it, the more fascinating they seemed. It's always upsetting when you find out that you can't actually be a dinosaur yourself. Yes, it is. It, it is a shame, but you know that is the nature of nature. <laughs> Um, and the science of, of tyrannosaurs and dinosaurs in general, but specifically what we know about tyrannosaurs has changed quite a bit, even mm -hmm. in you know, the last 10 years. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Sure, yeah, so um, tyrannosaurs has an advantage compared to a lot of other big dinosaurs in that we've got a lot of specimens of tyrannosaurus, and that's rare. I mean, it's something I don't think the public appreciates as much, is that most dinosaurs, most fossil animals are known from one specimen, and that's not even complete. Um, and you can't do that much science when your sample size is one. Uh, but for Tyrannosaurus, we know a lot. Um, it happens by chance to be extremely well sampled. Uh, so we have dozens of specimens that are at least 30% complete or more. Uh, some of them are almost, you know, 90%, maybe a little more than that complete. Um, we have multiple growth stages. We don't have every growth stage. We, for instance, as of recording, we do not yet have a Tyrannosaurus egg or a definite Tyrannosaurus hatchling. Uh, but we have multiple growth stages, so we know something about their changes throughout their life. Um, and we have, you know, a halfway decent uh, sample size. Uh, and because of that, we can actually do things like statistics and comparisons and get a sense of variation in a population. And so because we have so much information about it, Tyrannosaurus is sort of the go-to dinosaur if you've come up with a new type of study. Like you have a new way of looking at how old an individual was at time of death. Tyrannosaurus is one of the first dinosaurs you study. Uh, you have some sort of new biomechanical approach. Tyrannosaurus is one of the first creatures you study. And then this recent study that came out in March mm -hmm. changed our portrayal of not just tyrannosaurs, but theropods in general. Mm -hmm. um, usually the way they've been portrayed in both things like popular culture like Jurassic Park um, and in scientific reconstructions is to have their teeth exposed kind of like a crocodilian. So even when their mouth is shut, all of their teeth would be exposed on the outside. You'd be able to see them. Um, this new study changes that and uses a few different methods to rethink that idea and come up with a new way to reconstruct, not only to reconstruct 
Tyrannosaurus heads, but also to think about how they would feed, um, biomechanics and things, so it does have some other repercussions. This is obviously not a real Tyrannosaurus skull. The, the actual skull this is based on is about five feet long. This is a specimen called Stan. Um, and we obviously don't have the flesh on it. Um, and we're unlikely to really ever get all the flesh on the face of a dinosaur. The, the face is one of the first places that animals scavenge. Go out in nature, you find a lot of exposed bone on the face, even if the rest of the animal might still have skin on it. Um, so we it didn't have direct information as to what was going on in the face. And so the very earliest art of Tyrannosaurus and other, other carnivorous dinosaurs actually gave them lizard lips. Um, you go back to artists like Charles R. Knight, uh, the dawn of the 20th century. And when I say lizard lips, I don't mean these. You know, lizards don't have flexible, muscular lips the way a mammal does. Uh, but they do have a layer of, s of tissue, a layer of soft skin, covered by a layer of scales so that when the upper jaws and the lower jaws close down together, they form a seal. And that's the way Tyrannosaurus was portrayed for, for a while. But then people started to look at crocodilians, and there are some similarities in the facial bones of Tyrannosaurus and crocodilians, and so they hypothesized that, um, that the skin of Tyrannosaurus ended basically at the bone line, because that's what it does in crocodilians. In both lizards and crocodiles, they've got skin covering all the way down to the bone line, and then lizards have this layer of tissue with the scales on it to form the lips. Crocodiles don't have that, so their teeth are exposed. Um, now, the actual closest relatives to Tyrannosaurus alive today are birds, and they don't have lips either. Of course, what they have is beak. They don't have teeth either. Um, and this recent paper is based on a study that really got started in 2011. It's been going on for a while uh, to look at multiple lines of evidence. Um, and one of the things they looked at is the fact that the facial bones in Tyrannosaurus really aren't that much like the facial bones in crocodilians. They don't have the hundreds of little foramina, the hundreds of little pits that crocodilians have. Rather, they have a, a row of a relatively small number of large foramina right above uh, the tooth row. That's what we see in lizards and snakes. It's what we see in carnivorous dinosaurs in general. It's actually what we see in the ancestors of crocodilians before they became aquatic uh, ambush predators. So that's one line of evidence, that the facial bones are actually more like lizards. Um, so the, um, uh, this team looked at something else, which is uh, the wear and tear on the teeth of tyrannosaurs and some of their kin. And when you section through the teeth and look at it under a microscope, you could see to what degree the layers are worn down by the outside. In crocodilians, there's a fair amount of wear and tear because they're exposed all the time. Uh, but at least they're mostly wet because crocodilians, of course, spend a lot of time in the water. In living lizards, you don't see that. And in fact, what's going on is that the outsides of the teeth are protected because Lizards are actually pretty gummy. If you see a, a Komodo dragon open its jaws, you don't actually see a lot of teeth in there. You see gums. Same thing with a, a Gila monster or something like that. If you look at their skulls, they have huge teeth compared to their skull size. But you don't see that when they open up because the teeth are protected by the gums. And because they're normally protected by the gums, they don't get a lot of wear and tear. And what happens is when a lizard like that bites down, on, well, hopefully not on you, when it bites down on its prey, the gums get pushed back, the teeth sink down into the meat, and they can tear it out. Well, looking at sections of Tyrannosaur teeth, they found the same sort of pattern we see in lizards, suggesting that those teeth, huge as they are, were protected by gums. Um, and so they have this evidence of the facial bones and the evidence of the, the microscopic structure and the wear and tear on the teeth. Um, and then they said, let's take a look at the geometry. Because some people said, well, you can't close the jaws of tyrannosaurs and, and, and not have the teeth covered. But is that actually true? So they got out their calipers uh, and their steel tape and took measurements on a lot of skulls of lizards, of crocodilians, uh, of dinosaurs, and found that actually the size of the teeth relative to the length of the skull in something like a tyrannosaurus is no more extreme than we see in a monitor lizard 
like a Komodo dragon or, uh, or any Gila monster or creatures like that, which do have lips uh, and do close their mouths and you can't even see their teeth at all. Um, so the geometry is consistent with it as well. And we've always known that the lower jaw of a tyrannosaur or other carnivorous dinosaur for the mo most part fits all the way inside the tooth row of the upper jaw. So it's not like a crocodilian where the teeth might sort of interlace when they close their jaws. Um, and so the weight of the evidence they found was more consistent with Tyrannosaurus and its kin having lizardy lips and gummy jaws. Um, and so when they would open their mouth, it wouldn't look like in Jurassic Park. It would look more like a Komodo dragon opening its mouth. Doesn't mean that they weren't dangerous, just like a Komodo dragon is today. Once it would clamp down those jaws on a Triceratops or a duckbill, those teeth would pierce into the flesh and crush the bone and all the cool things that they do with their teeth. Um, but when they'd open their mouth in general, you wouldn't necessarily see the great big long, you know, stabbing teeth sticking out of the mouth. So those foramina that mm -hmm. we're talking about are little openings on the edges of the jaw that sort of pertain to where the teeth are, but not quite. Right. And in lizards and snakes and in theropods, they line the edge of the, basically the tooth border along the jaw. But in crocs, they don't do that. In crocs, there's a ton of them all mm -hmm. over the snout. And they sort of have different um, functions mm -hmm. in that in crocodiles, they're serving a sensory apparatus to sort of sense the environment in addition to uh, getting sensation from the face. But in theropods and in lizards and snakes now, the idea is that those are blood vessel openings mm -hmm. and nerve openings for that tissue that would be covering the teeth. So that was an additional line of evidence that they were using. That's that. right. Yes. Oh, and it's worth noting. I should do this because it's my home institution, that the, uh, the existence of those pressure sensors all over the face of crocodilians was first demonstrated here on campus at the University of Maryland back in the day over in what was then called uh, the Department of Zoology. It's now part of the, uh, the B-Sci department, one of your old home departments. Go Terps. Go Terps. Um, all right, so now that we've covered sort of anatomy and mm -hmm. The, the study. It's a, it's a very cool study. It doesn't, uh, no, not it doesn't. It sort of changes our perception of what these animals would look like, how they're actually using their faces, and that can lead to more understanding of how they ate, um, feeding biology, biomechanics of the head and neck. Uh, it does have broader implications than just these look different than what we thought they look like. So there, there are more uh, deeper uses for this type of research. Um, all of that said, mm -hmm. this study, the one from March, even though this research has been going on for a decade at this point, this particular study is a little bit marred by some ethical issues that have come up probably in the, in the time between mm -hmm. submission of the paper to a scientific journal and the publication of that paper, which usually takes months to years of time where people are reviewing it and uh, getting it ready for publication. And that leads to these questions of what do we do with the science? Because there are many other authors on this work that have been working on this and we're not at all involved in that. And now with the publication of this research and those accusations coming out, um, the whole study is brought into this sort of negative light, even though the science is good, so I bring this question to you. Mm -hmm. What do we do in these cases? Do, can, we, can we separate the science from a single scientist that was involved, or how, how do we handle this? Yeah, and this is, this is an issue, and, and it would be nice if there were easy answers to this, but there's a, real, a reason ethics is a field of study, because sometimes these don't have really easy, ins easy answers. Uh, for instance, as far as I know, um, none of the other authors um, were involved in these issues and may have been entirely unaware of it. Um, I don't know. It's up for them to say. Um, additionally, the author in question was the one who got the whole re 
research started back in 2011, and I, I remember a presentation back in 2016 about this. Um, so, do the other authors, if they were to exclude that author from the paper, saying that we don't want to be associated with them, would it be ethical for them to include his research in there? Because that's an entirely other ethical problem, publishing, uh, publishing information without proper recognition of the person who generated it. Obviously, you don't want to go with that approach. Um, did they want to say, oh, we shouldn't publish this at all? And I know I had colleagues who said, oh, they should never publish this paper then. But it's the research that these people have been devoting some time to. And sure, whether or not Tyrannosaurus has lips or not isn't going to cure cancer. But quite frankly, the research of the people who were saying this, that wasn't going to cure cancer either. Um, so it is work that, that they accomplished, and it is interesting information. Um, I don't honestly know exactly what I would do in that situation. You know, they, they, they could have perhaps asked the person to step down as an author, but it's already in process, or, you know, have some special acknowledgement at the end. But uh, it's tough, uh, because science is done by humans, and humans are, are flawed. Um, and no human is 100% good or 100% evil. Uh, you know, we could try to live ethical lives, and hopefully most of us can achieve that. Um, but not all of us do. Um, and one thought, uh, of course, might be that the, uh, now that it's known, people may choose not to work with that particular researcher in the future. That would be, uh, in fact, to do so, to work with them, would be a choice that you are making, and, and you would have to live by the consequences of that choice. But retroactively, going to the back, um, that's a tougher, uh, a tougher issue. You know, we can't delete all the research that was done in the past by people uh, for whom ethical issues have been uh, have come up or they've been accused of. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's a challenge. Uh, science is done by human beings, and human beings have good and human beings have bad, and Ideally, we might want to think if the, the information itself is, is what we're after. And I could see that argument that we're after the, the information that's being obtained and the hypotheses that are being tested and so forth. But we can't 100% divorce the information of the science from the fact it's done by people. Uh, and you know, in the past, you know, that sort of idea has been used to, to dismiss certain authors and not, and not include people as authors in a paper, uh, even though they contributed to it. Um, so um, yeah, I think it's a real challenge. Uh, it's something that every researcher who works with others um, has to consider. Um, and it's something that uh, you know, there should be discussions about. Uh, I don't know that we're going to find a universal answer. Um, but it's definitely something that is a challenge in a, a, a situation where, especially a smaller field like vertebrate paleontology, where there aren't vast numbers of, of different institutions and places you can work uh, or people you can work with. So uh, yeah, uh, long story short, uh, I don't know of any single simple solution. I think what we can all agree on is that it's really unfair to the other authors mm -hmm. on this work to judge this work harshly or dismiss it completely when their, their research is just as valid, um, and especially because they weren't involved right. in, in that. So it's a really complicated issue. You can't just dismiss the whole line of research done by a single person because science builds on itself, and you'd be unraveling you know, decades worth of research that other people have used, the, the whole thing could come tumbling down if you start to delete mm -hmm. research you know, off, off the record. Um, so it's complicated. Mm -hmm. It's a complicated issue. And I think you know, one of the best uh, strategies, the strategy that I took here, is to discuss the work and discuss the ethical implications yep. at the same time so that um, you don't just 
gloss over it, um, but you still talk about the work in a, in a positive light. So, yeah. Final thoughts? Final thoughts. On T-Rexes or on ethics? Right. Um, <laughs> uh, science in general? Science in general. Science is awesome. Tyrannosaurus is particularly awesome. Uh, people can be awesome. Most people can be awesome most of the time. Unfortunately, we're not always awesome most of the time. So be awesome. There you have it. We'll see you next time on Science on the Street. <laughs>